Hi. We serve a mighty God, amen. There, I've got so much stuff going through my head. I'm trying to figure out what the Holy Spirit wants me to share, what he wants me to, 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 to hold on for my own personal study and my own personal growth. And so I apologize if I sound like or feel like or look like a little discombobulated. Um, I've had a really good week this past week, amen. And I would, I would be hard-pressed to uh, tell you that uh, it hasn't been hard. It hasn't been uh, rough. I'd be lying to you. It's, it's been a pretty hard week. It's been a pretty rough week. And if you're not saying or agreeing with me, then you got a problem. Because all week long this past week, every single night, through song, through preaching, through the Spirit just moving and working, every single born-again, true born-again believer had to have felt conviction. And when you feel true conviction, if you're anything like me, it wears you out. When you go home and you're so exhausted that your head hits the pillow and you're like, you got me, Spirit, let me just try to wake up the next day and try a new, a new transformation, try and fix the life that you want me to have. It's exhausting, is it not? Yeah. Now, I'm sorry, Pastor Casey, you would not do this, but I'm going to do it anyway because I need people in here to understand something. This man goes through hell and high water for this church. And when it comes to tired, no one in here was as tired as this man was last week. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm sharing this with you because he would not. And I'm bragging on you, so I do apologize, but I want you to understand that no one in here has any excuse whatsoever to do what God calls you to do because this man goes above and beyond. I saw in his eyes and his face every single night from Saturday when we set up the tent to today, every single time I had a conversation with this man, it was his face was exhaustion. The only thing propping this man up was the Holy Spirit and the drive to serve Jesus. And that's what each and every single one of us need. He's, he's touched on it, and I want to touch on it again. Saturday, being with Joe and family, getting zero sleep, a couple of hours, and then waking up and being there to set up that tent for revival, knowing full well we needed to have that event revival. Have, being there for the leaders meeting, getting leaders to unify, to build God's kingdom. How many of you have had a rough day, rough night, and said, you know, I'm sorry, Lord, but I am just wicked tired, and I just can't do it today for you today, God. If you're true and honest with yourself here and now, I guarantee you each and every single one of us, myself included, have said that once or twice in my life. I'm too tired to do that today, Lord. So none of us, none of us should ever have an excuse to serve God. So here's my excuse. It was a rough week. And guys, I'm not as prepared as I'd like to be for today. So if you would please honor me with grace tonight, the Spirit's going to have his way because I'm not as prepared as I'd like to be. Praise God. I thought I had an idea of what the Lord wanted me to preach tonight a week and a half ago. They changed it up on me on Saturday. And it's important because it's a message that I'm sure each and every single one of us have heard once or twice before. But it needs to be reiterated again because as we get ready to journey down this path that God has for this church this year, we need to understand how important our actions are because they speak loudly over our words. You can say the words... But how you act is far more important than what comes out of your mouth when it comes to words. And tonight I'm going to share with you what the Lord's laid on my heart. And I'm going to open up to you guys some of the struggles that I've been going through. And I pray that you'll be praying for me. Because this is one of those 
difficult sermons that it's hitting home for me. Where the Lord has been working heavy on me. And so just like Pastor Casey says, when the Lord hits us, we, we flat to our face, broken. And we learn, and we grow, and then we share with you. So that's what tonight is. Tonight is me sharing with you how I've been broken, and now I, how I need to continue to grow. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So you really please turn with me there, and give me an amen when you get there. It has been a really long week, and I'm sure each and every single one of us are tired. But this is important. So I want your attention, not so much myself, but the Holy Spirit wants your attention tonight. So I want you to clear your minds. I want you to focus on what the Holy Spirit has in store for you. Don't look at me. Don't listen to what I'm telling you. You listen to what the Spirit is telling you through me and through the scriptures. Now, this is sunrise, so we honor God's word. So if you're willing and able, please stand with me for the reading and hearing of God's holy word. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to read all 13 verses. Follow along with me. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we have all knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through him all things, and through him we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol, until now, Eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols. And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Let us pray. O oh, Father God in heaven, we come humbly as we know how, through your throne of grace and mercy. Father, we have had such a blessed week of your spirit having his way, and so, Father, we pray again that your spirit continues to revive this church so that we can continue to grow closer to you and go out and set this world astraight. Father, I pray that tonight each and every single person under my voice will cast out whatever desires of the flesh that are in their hearts and minds and focus solely upon what the spirit has in store for them this evening. Father, I pray that you will empty this vessel. There is not much left in it, but Father, there is a little bit of the weakness of the flesh in there. And Father, I pray that you will cast it out now. Empty this vessel and allow your spirit to fill me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Let your spirit have his way. Speak through me with power and authority. Anoint me from on high so that your words will be heard, not mine. Help me to get out of the way, Father. You know I'm not prepared, so I am relying solely on you this evening, Father, to speak your sound, to speak your power, and to speak your words tonight. Father, I pray that every single person under my voice who calls themselves a born-again believer will heed the warnings of the Holy Spirit when it comes to setting the example for their brothers and sisters around them. Father, I pray, as always, that you allow your will to be done. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. You may be seated. 
All right. So, here we are again. The Apostle Paul, he's got a little letter for the Church of Corinth. So, give you some of the backstory. This is when the break of the Christian church started to form. And there were two factions warring over religion. There were the Jews and there were the Christians. And what they would do is they would go down into the markets of Corinth. And these meats would be sold by these market keepers. And the Jews would see these meats that were sacrificed to idols being sold. And Christians were buying them. And eating them. And so there was this big, huge battle in the church of Corinth. What are you doing? Why should we? You know, massive arguments. We talk about this all the time, how churches argue over the stupidest things. Amen. But here we are again. We have a faction, a warring faction within a church over meat. Seems silly, but yet we somehow can relate. Can we not? Because we war over so many of the stupidest things in our church, do we not? Yes. So that's what's going on here. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's trying to get them to focus on what really matters. And that's glorifying God. But he's also twisting it up to say, look, we'll get to the end, but Cliff notes, what you do sets an example for those around you. So put a pin in that, hold on to it, because it's extremely important that we all understand that point. Your actions set an example for others. So let's look in the first few verses here. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we have all knowledge. Anybody have some good knowledge in here? Ah, uh, trick question. Because we don't want knowledge, we want... That's right. Knowledge is of the world, wisdom is of God. So, knowledge puffs up, love edifies. You see, knowledge, you walk around with the old peacock feathers, strutting your stuff, I know more than you know. No, you know nothing. You truly know nothing. What you should know, you don't know enough of. And if anyone thinks, verse 2, that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. Now, folks, I like to consider myself a pretty intelligent person. And this one really hits home. Because a lot of times, I like to show off. People ask me for math questions. People ask me for knowledge. I can keep all of this useless information... Somebody in the back must have said that. Okay. Useless information. It's just filled up in here. I can't get rid of it. But I'm starting to grow to get the word in here because that's more important. I can't remember. Oh, shoot. I can't remember what it was. Oh, that's the, it was the percentage thing. Shelly was asking me how to take the percentage of a number, and I threw out the formula. Is over of equals percent over 100. And she's like... Or Casey, how do you know that? I learned it when I was in school, and I can't get rid of it. Quadratic formula. <laughs> I'm not saying it for you because I'm not boring you, but I know it. Useless information. When am I ever going to use the quadratic formula? Seriously, when am I ever going to need to learn the slope of a line? But I know. You know what I really need? I need this. This has more power in it than any math, science, chemistry, or physics formula that I can ever memorize. This has more power in it. Knowledge is useless, and if you think you know, you don't know nothing. And that's a double negative, and I learned that in English. Verse 3, but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Folks. That one is a good one to circle. You see, we've talked about how saying the words, I know Jesus, or saying, oh, I'm a Christian, or attending church and checking your boxes, or doing what you think a Christian is supposed to do is not enough to get you into heaven. 
You have to know Jesus. I said this a few months ago when I was up here on the stage. Imagine you're sitting in front of the judge. Casey just used it this morning. The judge almighty, the mightiest of all judges, the father himself is the judge. And he will decide whether you get in or not. And your only defense is Jesus, the greatest defense lawyer of all time. And after all of your sins are read out by Satan, who's abused and he's accusing, after all of your sins are worn out, the greatest defense lawyer known to man will stand up and say, but I paid his wages. And he is set free through my blood because Jesus knows me. That's the thing. I use the analogy. If you try to get into the White House to see the president, and you're like, oh, I know the president. I know the president. Secret Service is going to handcuff you and probably throw you into a white padded cell. But if you walk into the place and you really know the president and he comes out and says, oh, whoa, 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 let him go, let him go. I know that guy. Come on in, come on in. You're allowed in the White House because I know you. That's the same exact analogy for Jesus. When you go to stand up there against the judge, it's not how much you've done. It's not about how much how many times you've attended church. It's not about how many times you called yourself a Christian. And it's not even about how many times you've read this. It's not. It's about how much Jesus knows of you. The scariest verse in the Bible. I never knew you. Be gone. That's Jesus speaking. I never knew you. You have to know him. And he has to know you. And it says it right there. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. If you love God, that's just a small piece. You've got to put God first. You've got to love God, and he has to know you. That's what gets you into heaven. That and only that. He has to know you. You have to have a relationship. You cannot just call upon his name when you're down. You cannot just pick up your Bible when you're bored. You can't just show up when church is open. All of those things are good, but it's not enough. You have to have a relationship and be known by him. Now we get into a long set of scriptures that talk about the eating of food. Therefore, concerning the eating things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, stop there. This is interesting, and I apologize, Pastor Casey, I might be throwing a little bit of precursor coming up here in a couple weeks. Deuteronomy 32. If you, if you want to kind of get a heads up of what's coming, go read. What was it, Wednesday? Or was it Thursday? Thursday. Talked to a gentleman, and he talked about Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims. He talked about all of these gods, and he said... You tell me that there are 3,999 different gods out there and you only worship one, and I will tell you there are 4,000 out there that can be worshipped. That's what he said. And thankfully, through the Holy Spirit led through Casey, and he said, Deuteronomy 32 says that these other gods were actually demons, devils. Now look here in verse 5, for even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth. Folks, there were so-called gods that were worshipped by pagans and today being worshipped by Buddhists and Muslims and Hinduists. These so-called gods are actually demons in the flesh. Demons being worshipped. And here we are, we're learning that these people are sacrificing these meats to demons and devils. Now, if I told you that I had a platter to hand to you that was sacrificed to a demon, how many would be hungry enough for it? Mm-mm. I wouldn't even be in the same room as one of those things if that was known. But yet... That's the problem that the church of Corinth has. 
is the Jews are seeing Christians eat from sacrificed meats to idols. Devils, folks. Demons. Verse 6, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through him are all things, and through him we live. Do you truly live for Jesus? That's a question you need to ask yourself. And I guarantee you, you're probably going to be lying to yourself. You're probably trying to fool yourself. Oh, yeah, I live for Jesus. Oh, yeah, I live for Jesus. Look at all the things that I do. You're probably lying to yourself. Because there's so much more we should be doing for Jesus and his kingdom. The church as a whole, guarantee you, majority of them are not living for Jesus. Because you can see the depravity that we've experienced in this country and abroad. So many Christians out there just checking their boxes, showing up, doing their thing, and out the door they go. Well, wait a minute. Don't we have the same problem under our roof right here right now? Oh, boy. We love to point the finger at the megachurches, do we not? We love to call out show and show down the straight. How about removing the wood plank out of your eye first before you worry about the speck over there? Folks, we have a small church here. Many of us know each other close and personally for many, many years. Folks, there are wolves among us that play the part they question. You need to ask yourself, each and every single one of us, are we truly living for Jesus? Or are we only pretending? Skip down to verse 9. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. So now, we get to the nitty-gritty, the meat and potatoes of what's going on here. They are okay. Paul is telling the church of Corinth, you Christians, you believers, those of you who live for Jesus, eating this meat is okay. There's nothing wrong with it because you know that it's been sacrificed to a false idol. You know it's okay. You ingesting this meat is not going to harm you. However, Paul says, he gives a caveat. He says, hold on. Yes, you're going to be perfectly fine. However, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. So he says, hold on. How you live your life is an example set for those who are weak. The cool thing about this message and how I knew full well the second I started downstairs. Uh, uh, Smitty, not going to be here today. He texted me uh, a week or so ago and said, hey, can you, uh, can you pr do Sunday school for the high school students? I said, absolutely, but you're going to have to remind me. Saturday, he reminds me, hey, you got high school students. Okay, cool. So I get here Sunday morning, help set up all the sound and the live stuff, and then I head downstairs to the high schoolers. And I said, guys, I don't know what's going on. I'm unprepared. Spirit's going to have to lead this discussion. Let's get our books out where you guys want to go. Luke says, I think we're on Lesson 7. Okay, cool. Let's crack open to Lesson 7. So I flip over to the page. Guess what we're talking about? 1 Corinthians chapter 8. The high school students are on the same lesson that God's laid on my heart for this message tonight. Absolutely. That's how God works, folks. Same thing we were talking about downstairs is the example that we set for the people who are weak in the faith around us. So I brought it up. I said, okay, kids, what are your favorite foods? So we went around the room, steak. Anybody love steak? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Donuts. 
Anybody love donuts? Mmm. How about cronuts? Mmm. Taking a croissant and a donut, and you make a cronut. Oh, I feel like Homer Simpson, you know, drooling. Oh. Food. So I want you guys to think. Sorry. Sorry if you're all hungry. I apologize. <laughs> I want you to think of your favorite food right here, right now. What's your favorite food? I didn't ask out loud, but okay. <laughs> this isn't class participation time. <laughs> Mexican, yeah. Well, I mean, that's an all-encompassing. Let's narrow it down. <laughs> so I want you to think of your favorite food. And then I want you to think... If someone came to you and said, this has been sacrificed against a pagan god, would you pass it up? It's your favorite food. Let's make it even harder. You haven't had your favorite food in a year. It's been a year since you've had your favorite food. And today of all days, you are craving Mexican. Want it so bad. And you sit at the table, and you put the old napkin in, and you grab the fork and knife, and you belly up. And then they say, here's your food. Oh, mouth-watering, nachos, shredded beef, tortilla shells, quesadillas, insert Mexican words. <laughs> Buenos noches, that's about all I know. Did I get it good, Sarah? Not good? No, crap. <laughs> And then someone says, and your, your mouth is watering, and someone says, by the way, this entire plate was prayed over by us Buddhists in the back, by us Hindu, by us pagan people back in the back. We prayed over this, and we've, we've offered it to our pagan false gods. Here you go. Now, you're craving that food. You're so hard, hungry. You're starving. You want it. Would you let it pass? Would you say No not going to happen so that's what we talked about downstairs is so many things that we enjoy in our lives that we love to do whether it's food whether it's activities where whatever it is the things that we love outside of church if someone said you need to stop doing that because it would cause someone else to sin would you stop now we're getting personal. Real easy to say, oh, yeah, I would. But then, don't we have a problem in this church and the church in America that as soon as we walk out those doors, we go right back to the world we live in? Right back to the sins in our life, right back to the distractions, right back to the devil and his temptations. God is asking you to give it up, and you're telling him no. God is demanding your attention, and you're telling him you've got better things to do. See, it's easy for us to say out loud, yeah, you're right, I would. If that plate come to me and someone said they prayed over for a pagan idol, I would just shove it aside and say, I'll have Mexican another day. But the thing is, is God's telling us right here, right now, that there are sins in our life that we need to get rid of, and we're telling him, eh, maybe next week. How about next month, God? I'll, I'll enjoy it now, but next month I'll get better. See, by the silence and the looks on your face, I think we know what the problem is. We're not willing to give up the things because we like them too much. These liberties of ours, verse 9, these temptations that we enjoy doing, some of them can cause a weaker person in the faith to fall and stumble. You go out and you do whatever it is you do. If someone who just came into church for the very first time and is starting to learn and say, you know what, I'm not sure I know much about this Jesus feller, but... I want to know more. And they see you in Walmart cursing up a storm. 
They see you in Walmart stealing. They check you out flipping the bird, yelling and screaming, bashing, hate. They see you taking things you're not supposed to take. They see you hoarding things in greed. They see you. What do you think they're going to think? Well, shoot, if, if so-and-so can do that, I, I, guess, I guess I can do that. They're, they've been going to church for 10, 15 years. I guess if, if they get mad and angry and yell and scream at somebody, then I guess I can do that. They've been going to church for five, six, seven years. They're over there stealing. I guess it's okay to steal. You see, the example that we set is so important. We're about ready to go on a cusp. We're about ready to break these walls down. This church, God is going to do some amazing things in this church. And he wants to use each and every single one of you here tonight to do something. But he needs you on board. He says, There's, I've just got a couple more things in each and every single one of your lives. If you will just get rid of them, I'm going to show you how awesome you're going to be for my kingdom. But I need you to just get rid of this and that and this and, and just, we're almost there. We're almost there. Once we get to that plateau, guess what? We're going to do amazing things. And that doesn't mean that once we get there, we're done. Because you know what God's going to do? He's going to raise the mountain a little higher. He's going to say, now come on. You were at the peak. I made you do amazing things. But now I've lifted the mountain. Let's go. You see, it's always an uphill battle for a Christian. It's always going to be about us getting better in our walk with Christ. Until we draw the last breath in our lungs on this earth and are with our Savior in heaven, every day of your life is you moving up that mountain. We're almost there. We're going to do amazing things, but each and every single one of us have got to be on board. We have to stop being the stumbling block for the weaker. Because if you are still living in your sin and you go out into this world, you're going to make a fool of yourself. And worst of all is you're going to lead somebody who you thought you were going to try and pull to Christ. You're going to lead them to fail. That is my biggest fear. I am so afraid that I'm not prepared. But I'm asking God to prepare me because I want to be prepared. So that when I go out and I start witnessing to these LBG29875 people. And I start witnessing to the lost and dying world. When I start leading people to Jesus. I want to make sure that I'm prepared so that I don't fail. Because I don't want to get to heaven and have all the people rattled off and say, you know, you weren't ready because you had this sin in your life and you didn't get rid of it. And then you thought you were ready and you went out and you witnessed and you failed and now this person's in hell. It's going to break my heart. It's absolutely going to tear me to pieces because I knew, I've been told the Lord has convicted me of the sins in my life and it's time to move on from them so that I can get prepared for getting the people in church and most importantly to Jesus. So in verse 10, Paul goes on to tell the church of Corinth, he says, For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. See, he says it's okay for you to eat the meat. But if you do, will that cause the person who Christ died for to perish. And this perish word is a very soft word. It's perish. It sounds like a water. Perish. But let's put some emphasis on this. This is the eternal death. This is sending someone to hell. To suffer in eternal damnation and torment. All because we messed up and caused them to stumble. That's why it's so important. 
Our actions, our lives, and the things we do set the example for the weak. Our actions set the example for the young in Christ. And the question is whether or not we're going to continue to live in our temptation or if we're going to make a choice and say, you know what, I want to be ready. I want to be prepared. And then last verse, verse 13, Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. You see, Paul tells him, he wraps it up in a big old bow. He says, guys, if eating this meat, which I have told you is perfectly fine, because we all know idols don't exist, and we're saved by the blood of Christ, but by eating it, we cause someone else to fail then he's going to give up meat. Paul tells the church of Corinth, if me doing this causes someone to stumble, then I'm done. I will not do the things that I love or want if it causes a brother or sister to fall. That's the message. Look at your actions. Turn with me. To Romans chapter 14. Thank you. Romans chapter 14. Let's look at verses 11 to 13. Read along with me. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Folks, that right there is it in a nutshell. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. And when your turn comes, you will stand before God himself and give an account for every single thing you have ever done in your life. And the question is whether or not you're going to be on the good side or on the bad side. Whether or not you caused people to stumble and go to hell, or if you led them to Christ. Your example is so important. You have no idea. What are you going to do, church? What are you going to do? Here's where my stumbling block is. Tonight, I want to share with you my stumbling block and I want to ask the church to help me to pray for me and to help me all my life I've wanted to be everyone's friend I've wanted people to like me I've wanted people to care about me and I've wanted to just make people happy and so that means that I've had to live on both sides of the fence because I've had to pick this person happy over here and then jump to the other side of the fence to make this person happy over here because I wanted them both to like me. I wanted them to care about me. I wanted them to love me. And what God broke me last week, and I went to Pastor Casey about it and I asked him to pray for me, is the spirit of affirmation. I need every single one of you to give me an affirmative that I'm doing a good job. That you like me, that you like seeing me, you like talking to me, that I'm your friend. I need that. That's my stumbling block, is I need to be everyone's friend. And I've got to stop. Because there is only one affirmation that I need is to know that I am pleasing my Lord and Savior. Amen. So I'm asking the church. I told Pastor Casey, I said, when I first started ministry, 
I said, I've always looked down to him, not as in looking down to him, but I, when I'm standing up here, I look for confirmation that I'm doing good. When I first started preaching, I always looked to him. Am I all right? Am I good? And that's a stumbling block for me. Because if I truly believe and trust and have faith in the Holy Spirit, he will lead me and guide me, and every word that comes out of my mouth will be of him, through him, and by him. And I don't need the pastor to affirm me. But I did. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you now that I did. I needed that affirmation from Pastor Casey that I was doing a good job. And last week, I asked Pastor to pray over me to cast out the spirit of affirmation into my life because I don't need it anymore. I need to rely and trust on God through in and throughout that no matter what I say, no matter what I do, no matter what I am or who I am around, as long as I am doing everything in my power to live for him, I don't need another person's affirmation, A-OK, or you're doing a good job, attaboy. Taking it a step further, I've also needed your approval as a preacher when you come up and you give me the, hey, good job, great sermon. Hey, stepped on my toes, you got me good there, thank you very much. Those things helped build my pride. And so I'm asking the church, in love, stop. I'm breaking down in front of you guys here and now that I need you to pray that, that my pride will go away. If you felt the Holy Spirit through any word that I set up on this stage, then you praise God from yourself. You praise God from your pew, but don't tell me. If you thought the message was good, praise God, but don't tell me. Because I need to get over this affirmation spirit that I've got. Because it's breaking me to pieces, needing approval. And I can't allow this pride in my life anymore, folks. So I'm praying every single day to live for God, live for Christ, let my actions speak to my salvation so that anybody and everybody that sees me knows there's something different about that guy. 20 years ago, the Davin before is not the Davin now. And I'm gonna need your help now to get rid of the spirit of pride. So I'm not, I'm not telling you that I don't love you. Please don't hear that. I love every single one of you. Every single one of you. And I've needed you more than I should have. And so I'm now I'm asking, praise God from your pew, but don't tell me. And I pray that that through this message, the Holy Spirit has told you and convicted you, raised the sin in your life forward so that you're talking about it, thinking about it. The Spirit's weighing on your heart right here and right now that you need to cast it out to because, folks, I'm no better. I've got sin in my life, and I've just confessed. So now it's your turn. I pray that if there is sin in your life, that you will cast it out now, confess it, Call it by name and then make the choice, the hard choice to do something about it. And you will see amazing wonders. I cannot wait to see what this church is gonna do for God's kingdom when we get it right. Because it's going to be absolutely amazing. All for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, I just, Father, I'm broken. 
Father, it's, it, it, takes, it takes a different kind of person to admit their sin out loud. It takes the type of person who wants to live for you. And Father, I'm, I'm a vile, disgusting, filthy sinner that has done so many horrible things. But through your grace and your mercy, Father, you continue to use me, and I thank you for that. And Father, I pray that you will continue to work on this spirit that afflicts me so. That you will continue to cast it out because it has a stronghold in my heart and it knows exactly where it's set, where it lives, and where it has been for so many years. And so, Father, it's, it's tough to get rid of. But I knew through my brothers and sisters' prayer and that you're an almighty, powerful God that you will as long as I continue to make the choice to deliver myself from this spirit, that you will do what you must. And I thank you for that. Father, I pray that no matter what happens, that your will be done in this church. Father, I pray that each and every single sold out, born again believer under my voice heeds your warnings, hears your word, listens to the spirit and obeys. Father, I pray that they have... If they're thinking about a sin in their life right now, Father, I pray that they will pin that sin in their mind to say, that's the one. And as soon as they walk out those doors, that that sin, they remember that sin tomorrow, Tuesday, all week, and they say, that one, that's the one that the Holy Spirit weighed heavy on me, and that's the one that I need to get rid of. Father, because we are so forgetful, the second we walk out of those doors, we forget what you've laid on our hearts so easily because we are beset and tempted by the ways of this world. And so, Father, I pray that you will pin it so that we can recognize it, call it out, and turn from it. Because that's the way to true repentance, is to call it out and then turn from it. No matter how much it hurts, no matter how much we enjoy it, We've got to turn away from it. And Father, I look forward to what this church is going to do for those of us who get it right. I cannot wait to see what you have in store for us. Lord, we are so excited. The remnant, the true remnant inside of this church is so excited for what it is going to do for your kingdom. And Father God, we thank you so much ahead of time for what you're about to do. Father, I pray for those that are cold, those that are lukewarm. I pray for them. I pray that you will shake them, wake them up, and get on board. I thank you so much, Lord. I praise you for what you've done this night. Let us truly die to ourselves, take up our cross, and live for you. Nevertheless, as always, let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now before you go. The Spirit has been convicting souls tonight. I can see it on your face. The Spirit has had His way. So I want to open this altar. I want to ask the sound team to play a song for us. I want to ask you guys to stand. And if the Spirit has been weighing on you and you've got business to do, I pray you come up here and do business with God. Call it out and cast it out in the name of Jesus. The altar's open.